Welcome to Surgery for PMDD by the International Association for Premenstrual Disorders. If you are considering, preparing, going through or recovering from surgery for PMDD, then this video is for you. This video is made public with the kind help of Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health. As part of this project, we have developed a huge new section on our website just for those having surgery for PMDD. Head to our website, along the top bar you'll see surgery. Have a scroll down, it can be packed full of information to help you through your journey. We have information on surgical menopause, what it is, preparing for surgery, free downloads of hospital packing lists and recovery time charts, what is the correct surgery and of course all about the very confusing HRT. In this webinar we're going to cover why do people have surgery for PMDD. We'll look at the reproductive system, what is the surgery for PMDD, why do some people have a hysterectomy in addition to ovary removal, and of course how do I know if I'm progesterone intolerant. What is the process to get to surgery? We'll talk through preparing for surgery, types of surgery, recovering from surgery, including what to expect when you initially wake up, and just a brief touch on HRT for surgical menopause. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrea Chisholm, MD, who is a board certified obstetrician gynaecologist and a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. As Laura, as Laura mentioned, I've been involved with um, IAPMD for a number of years now, um, really from its uh, pretty much first, first year of existence. Um, I, up until about three years ago, uh, spent pretty much my entire career uh, in the Northeast, uh, between going to med school at Boston and doing my training in New York City and then heading back to Boston. And I was uh, very involved with a medical student and resident instruction at that time. Um, about three years ago, I decided that uh, I wanted to try my hand at a different, different, in a different uh, environment of medicine. And so I relocated out to very rural America. I'm in Cody, Wyoming. Um, so I am now way above sea level, and I am one of two uh, obstetrician gynecologists in uh, this small rural community. So, um, you know, women who are people who are suffering with PMDD, um, you know, often uh, will end up having to try many, many modalities. Uh, uh, there's a whole, um, you know, line of treatments that are uh, indicated and uh, should really be run through before uh, we deem that you are what we what we like to call sort of medically resistant PMDD. Um, and at that point in time, I, it may just be that actually going in and um, removing, we'll learn about it in a little bit, why, why how, how hormones are responsible for this condition actually going in and removing the organs, your ovaries, that produce your cyclical um, hormones are for some women, for some people with pain, no, no relief from any other modalities. And, and, and or just had relief for a while and then um, symptoms came back and uh, it seemed that medical, medical management was failing. So you know, it's it's actually it's 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 actually important to to look at this because um, the 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 organ that is responsible for producing the hormones are is number three, which are your ovaries. Most people will have two of them unless one's been surgically removed for some reason, and that is the hormonally active organ in the body. Um, number two represents the fallopian tubes, and the fallopian tubes truly are just a conduit or a hallway, uh, a transport mm -hmm. passageway for the ovulated egg to get um, into the into the uterus. Ultimately, um, with with a conception, what ends up happening is that sperm travels up through the uterus into the fallopian tube, and actually that's where fertilization happens, and then the egg. It wanders its way down and implants in the uterus, or number one. The uterus is where the pregnancy grows. Um, the ovary maintains some importance in pregnancy um, in that it produces some hormones to support the early stages of pregnancy. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, the third, number four, uh, well, number four is actually the, that entire red strip on the inside, which is the endometrium mm -hmm. or the lining of the uterus. And then um, number five is the cervix and number six is the vagina. And it's important to remember that, you know, our menstrual cycle every month, the intent of it is to procreate or be pregnant, to become pregnant. And um, it's the, the, the menstrual cycle um, uh, when pregnancy doesn't happen that you actually, actually will have a withdrawal okay. through your period. That's great. So the cervix is a bit that's tested during um, pap tests, is that we call them smear tests in the UK? Yeah, the cervix, yeah. So the cervix, yep. So the cervix is the cervix is what's responsible for maintaining its integrity um, in order to uh, let a pregnancy develop, let a baby form inside the uterus, and then with a mechanism that we really have no idea what incites it, uh, it's the cervix responsibility to dilate. Um, and allow passage of the baby into the um, into the vagina and be delivered. Uh, but the cervix is also because those cells there are undergoing rapid transition because it's a place where the cells that line the uterus are different from the cells that line the vagina. So that's the crossover area where cells are under rapid replication, um, and that's why um, it's so the cervix is so susceptible to human papillomavirus, which is intimately involved in causing cervical cancer, and that's what we're doing pap smears for, and that's why we do paps of the cervix. The cervix is connected to the uterus, but is a separate structure okay. from the So actually, your, your menstruation, your period, is actually the first day of a new hormonal cycle or menstrual cycle. Um, so what happens, the, your menstrual cycle is, is, is clearly divided um, into two, two halves, really. Um, one can be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, but we go by the model of a 28-day cycle. So we say roughly day 14 is midway between. And for anyone who's suffering PM, from PMDD, this is you know very, very, very clear to you. Um, but the first day of your menstrual cycle, um, until the 14th day when you ovulate is known as the follicular cycle. And during that, during that time of your cycle, um, your hormones, your ovaries start off with the hormones being quite low. But during that first part of the cycle, your estrogen level is coming back up um, uh, and, in, and, and increasing. And your progesterone level is coming up a smidge, but not too much. But at that 14-day mark, and what's happening in the lining of the uterus during your follicular phase is the lining is building up. It's, it's getting thicker. Again, like I said, getting ready to accept a implant, a, a, a fertilized egg. So at mid-cycle, when you ovulate, there's very significant hormonal disruption, mainly your progesterone, your, your progesterone level surges in response to brain hormones that are telling you to ovulate. And an egg is released and goes into the fallopian tube. Now, during the second part of your menstrual cycle, it's called the luteal phase. And during that period, or during that segment of your cycle, your progesterone level, which is now surging, is important because what it's doing is it's manipulating the lining of the uterus preparing it for fertilization. Um, and then during that time, your estrogen levels are a little bit lower relative to what they were in the first part of your, of your cycle. So the luteal phase is marked by high progesterone levels. And so, so luteal phase, second half of the cycle, roughly day 14 to 28, about the two weeks before you bleed, you're gonna have high, high, proge high progesterone levels and relatively lower estrogen levels. If a pregnancy, if, if you do not become pregnant, what ends up, well, if you do become pregnant, you become pregnant. If you don't become pregnant, your body then releases all of that and you have, you have your menstrual cycle and your hormone levels drop and the whole cycle starts again. The key, the key, absolutely key, step in the surgery for PMDD is bilateral, is removal of both of your ovaries, which is called a bilateral oophrectomy, taking out both of your ovaries. Those are, those are what produce the cyclical hormones 
those that need to come out to adequately treat you for uh, PMDD. The problem is, or the important point is, is that all of these structures are then inter interconnected. If you just take out your ovaries, um, and we'll, we'll learn learn longer, we, we'll get rid of the cyclic nature of um, the, the PMDD. What causes the, the cyclical nature of the hormonal changes that cause PMDD. But it's going to be important, and we'll learn about this a little bit later, that ultimately after your ovaries come out, so we don't have cycling levels of estrogen and progesterone, you're definitely going to need to be on some estrogen replacement long-term, both symptomatically and also long-term disease prevention. So we'll talk about that, but those ovaries need to come out. Now the problem is, is that if you are progestin intolerant, which uh, a, a fairly healthy, significant number of, of people who suffer from PMDD are, um, you really need to have your uterus taken out because it's very, very dangerous to take just estrogen replacement if you have a uterus, because what will happen is that, that the lining of your uterus will respond to the estrogen, like I explained earlier, like the early part of your cycle, and it will just continue to be stimulated and stimulated and stimulated. And we call that exposure to unopposed estrogen, which can significantly increase your, your risk of developing uterine cancer. So if your uterus stays, you need to be on a progestin, that can potentially just get you back to some PMDD-like symptoms. Um, the one plus potentially of keeping your uterus is that that does allow with reproductive um, uh, technologies in fertility treatment, the possibility of carrying a pregnancy, but that's a whole other story. But that would be one benefit potentially for keeping your uterus. The fallopian tubes um, uh, really serve no function once the ovaries and the uterus are, once the ovaries are removed and or once the uterus is removed. Um, so the fallopian tubes, um, really uh, should come out with one of these surgical procedures. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to back up what you were saying. So I was one of the people that couldn't tolerate um, progestins. And every month when I had to add it back in for 10 days a month, it would just add back in the PMDD symptoms, but with a lo nice load of um, nausea um, on top. So for me, it would have been pointless yeah. having the surgery and um, keeping my uterus because then I just would have been manually <laughs> giving myself um, PMDD symptoms every, every uh, 10 days a month. Not recommended. So, yeah, this is just um, a little diagram to sort of explain what you were exactly what you were saying. So the idea of removing the ovaries is to, to flatten out the fluctuations, sorry, that cause the PMDD yeah. symptoms. And by removing the ovaries, it's removing both the mm -hmm. estrogen and progesterone production. Important to remember that the that the ovaries um, are are not acting independently. They're being directed by precursor hormones in the uh, brain. And um, there's two levels of that. Uh, we'll probably get to that in a little bit, but. Uh, there's a, a central part of your brain that release, re releases something called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which then acts upon the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland produces FSH or follicle stimulating hormone that's responsible mainly for the estrogen production and dominates the early half, the first half of the cycle, mm -hmm. or the follicular cycle, uh, the follicular portion of your cycle. And then it all, the pituitary gland also produces luteinizing hormone, which is mainly responsible for the production of progesterone. And that dominates in the luteal phase of the cycle. And so it's, an, it's a feedback mechanism between the ovary and FSH and LH, and then ultimately back um, to the hypothalamic region of the brain that releases the GnRH. Yeah. So, um, 
do, you know, we're, we're just starting to, um, and there's a lot of great information um, on, on our website about the etiologies of um, PMDD and uh, looking at um, the, the mechanism by which the symptoms develop. I mean, we, we, we do know it's important to understand that estrogen and progesterone are what we call neuroactive hormones. And so they cross over or their, their, their um, metabolites cross over into the brain and interact with different um, uh, neurochemical systems in the brain. And um, they, they, especially with the, with the progestin uh, is, is metabolized to something called allopregnanolone, as we understand. And it has an, an interaction in um, the GABA system, we think, in the GABA system of the brain. And the GABA, the GABA system is um, the same system that's uh, affected by alcohol and benzodiazepines. And typically in uh, people who, I hate to use the term normally, but normally handle uh, progesterone at that receptor, uh, and it's not, not a deranged response, um, the the mm -hmm. progesterone is rather sedating. Um, for people who suffer from PMDD, what we believe is that either it's a it's either it's a, a, a problem at the receptor site or how that hormone is metabolized before it gets to the receptor that it actually causes agitation and irritability and is responsible for a lot of those symptoms of PMDD. Um, so how we might know if you are progestin intolerant or progesterone intolerant is either you have a predominant of those symptoms in your symptomatology of your individual PMDD symptoms and or when you've used products that contain a progestin which is a synthetic um, analog to your body's progesterone and it actually causes more problems in your brain potentially than just the natural progestin yeah. progesterone would uh, so using things like the birth control pill or any of the pills, either the combined birth control pill that has estrogen and progesterone in it or just a progesterone-only birth control pill or using one of the um, progesterone-containing um, IUDs um, in the states, that would be Mirena, Kylena, um, uh, or Skyla. Um, or needing to use, or, or using uh, uh, the Depo-Provera, the injectable contraceptive, or the one of the implants, Implanon. Um, and then even for even uh, uh, people who are, need to use the, a micronized progesterone, and a micronized progesterone is the closest that we have to our own natural um, progesterone. Um, and if you have symptoms with that, um, yeah, those, are, I, those are signs of uh, progesterone progestin or progestogen intolerance. <laughs> progestogen is the same thing as a progestin, yeah. it's just UK versus. Yeah, I think I, I've modeled them up as I've gone, <laughs> trying to keep track with all the different variations. But yeah, I, I definitely found that adding any progesterone-based treatments into my system were a very bad idea, um, especially personally for me, the marina, after a little while, I became very, very ill and it was like, Full on PMDD every single day, so I think it was was pretty clear that um, I don't do well. And even with yeah. the the, the um, oral micronize, which actually they told me to use vaginally, um, I still didn't do very yeah. very well on. And we'll, you know, and we'll see. You know, we, and then you say, I mean, one of the first line, if you look, I mean, the first, the second line of management for uh, PMDD medically is to go on a um, combined uh, contraceptive pill. So it sounds a little conflicting. Now for some women with PMDD, because there undoubtedly are various uh, uh, pathways to the symptom manifestation, for some people just simply being on level dose of hormones throughout the cycle, not allowing for those big hormonal shifts that happen in the luteal phase. For some people, that resolves symptoms. Um, for others, yeah. it makes the symptoms worse. And again, it would give you symptoms outside of your luteal phase. So you would have an onset of symptoms in the first two weeks of your cycle. Um, oftentimes, your brain will accommodate to that within a month, in a month. And we often will say to women, stick with it for at least three months before. But 
you would know, I mean, for, for you would know whether your symptoms were becoming significantly, significantly worse. And, you know, those were situations in which, um, you know, you may need to advocate for yourself and just go back to your provider and just say, listen, this is just, I, I'm just, I'm congested and tolerant. Can um, people just have one ovary removed and that would like half their PMDD? That gets asked a lot. How would that work? No. Unfortunately, 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 no. Um, that ovary just would take over um, uh, the, basically the normal normal production levels. We don't see a marked decrease. But um, about keeping their cervix, so people question a lot whether that should be removed as part of the surgery, or and would it make any difference to sex life, orgasms? and so forth and there tends to be very mixed answers on that one depending depending who you speak to and I, yeah and i think we're going to only get mixed answers to that i mean i think partially it's the approach that would determine whether the cervix would be able to stay or not for instance if if you had a vaginal mm -hmm. a vaginal hysterectomy that your cervix would in, inherently need to be need to be removed just because the approach is coming through the vagina and the first thing yeah. that you get to is the cervix. So that has to be. <laughs> um, you know, there's, yeah, I know there's a there's a there's you know there's been a lot of, a lot looked at in terms of sexual functioning in the cervix and um, you know the one the so so the cervix first first of all the cervix is, does not need to come out at the time of a hysterectomy. That does not need to happen. Um, one of the, the 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 people who advocate leaving your cervix um, you know, cite uh, pelvic floor support because um, there can you you can you don't have to interrupt significantly one of the the biggest ligamentous support to the pelvic floor, um, which is the uterosacral ligaments. It gives a little bit more support uh, just by leaving the cervix. Um, there was some, there's 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 a there are a group who of, of of experts who believe that the cervix is responsible for sexual functioning, although that really hasn't that really hasn't panned out um, when looking at um, sexual functioning before and after hysterectomy. Really, what's been looked at uh, and and specifically hysterectomy for. Uh, uh, for indications of um, either mm -hmm. abnormal uterine bleeding or fibroids or pelvic pain, what's been what's been cited best is sexual functioning before is uh, it helps determine the sexual functioning after hysterectomy. So, um, in terms of its its uh, um, uh, involvement in orgasm, I think really and what I've seen clinically in my own practice, I have I have not had patients come back and say that they're sexual functioning was tremendously diminished with yeah. the removal of their cervix. And putting it out there, <laughs> I had mine removed and everything feels the same as before. And the one benefit too of, you know, obviously removing the cervix would just be that, um, you know, for the most part, unless you had a significant history of some cer cervical uh, dysplasia or precancerous changes, um, you, you, you would not have to have a uh, pap smear and any so longer. We've got a couple of questions coming in. So there's quite a few questions coming in, some of them quite specific to people's individual circumstances. So if you can kind of um, bear with us until the end on those, just while we sort of work through the programme so we don't get um, sidelined, that would be would be great. So someone has just asked, um, how important is the cervix for vaginal structural support and bladder support? And someone also said they've heard of a risk of bladder prolapse rate later in life. Yeah, I mean, you know, the 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 just having your cervix removed itself is not going to necessarily increase the risk of um, of prolapse, especially um, you know if the if your your surgeon uh, you know practices the the appropriate technique to provide you some um, uh, support to the vaginal, the top of the vagina when they do the surgery, and and that's and that's I I could say mm -hmm. st standard care, um, you know. A uh, later life pelvic floor prolapse is really multifactorial. You know, has to do on your own your body's own inherent um, uh, uh, support, your collagen strength, your connective tissue strength. Has to do with what sort of um, trauma, obstetrical trauma you've had um, with deliveries. Uh, 
um, large mm -hmm. babies, that sort of thing, um, has to do with as we get older, um, after the age of 40, we have a persistent loss of, of, of muscle mass um, over year to year. And so it's really important to make sure that you're ad adequately exercising those muscles and that includes the muscles of the pelvic floor or there will be there will be muscle muscle wasting which is m more inherently what causes the the prolapse and then also estrogen plays a really important point too in maintaining pelvic health because it maintains um the blood flow to the area which helps maintain the strength of the pelvic floor muscles so on the um new section of the website there will there's a section um about thriving in surgical menopause and there will be a large section in there about um sexual function lubes um any sexual problems working on your pelvic floor muscles um and so forth so that will all be all be in there so you'll have evidence-based resources to read and that should be that section should be up and running in the next next few weeks so um, a lot of people have been asking, so what are the steps to to get towards surgery? Um, I know for myself, it was very long winded, same as for many people, you know, um, years of misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, finally getting referred to, to Dr. Panay in London, um, who is wonderful. He's also on our clinical advisory board um, and jumping through the hoops to, to finally get to surgery. It wasn't a, a quick process. And I want to stress that um, we see plenty of people in the support groups who, who don't want to take things like SSRIs or birth control pills, but they want to jump straight to surgery. And um, as you'll see, that is uh, very much not the case. So there we go. I'll pass back over to Andrew again. Yeah, I mean, I think that the 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 important thing is that it is really important to you know do your best to transition through um, all the treatment stages, unless um, you know there's a very 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 strong contraindication medical reason why you can't go through all of the the medical steps, um, and that's that's because you know having surgery, having a having your ovaries removed, having your uterus removed um, is, uh, you know, not is not reversible. Um, and, you know, pre premature menopause or premature surgical menopause, what you're going to be in once you're post op um, does carry its own, you know, long term potential medical risks and complications. And so you really need to be at a place where you can really have the benefits of that surgery outweigh the risks of that surgery, and that does take that does take time and it does take a process. Um, and as a as a clinician, um, you know it's important for us in our in our you know vow that we've all taken to do no harm that we do put the brakes a little bit on, so to speak, and 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 help you journey through these through these different treatment modalities to finally get to the point where, you know, you can finally, everyone can finally acknowledge the fact that it's failed, that it's failed um, medical management. But that being said, it's really important that once you embark on this phase of, you know, finally getting your diagnosis and then working through to find where on the spectrum of treatment you find mm -hmm. relief, um, it's important not to spend too much time in any one stage, you know, I mean, if you, if you, if you commit, you know, those three months, you need to commit three months. And if something isn't working within three months, it's important to be able to move on to the next stage. So this doesn't go on, you know, as part of our, part of our real hope um, for creating this whole, I would say, or you can just <laughs> agree, I hope that it's to help is to help, help people not have to flounder and help have this be just like any mm -hmm. other disease, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, you get a diagnosis, you get treatment, treatment instituted. Is that treatment working? Yes, it's working. You stick with it. No, it's not working. We move to the next thing. We move to the next thing. We move to the next thing. Um, and I just, yeah, that's what I was going to say. So I think actually that's another uh, webinar in itself talking through the um, treatment plan. Um, because I think yeah. it is, I remember going to the IEPD conference in February, uh, in Florida, sorry, two years ago, and hearing you speak through the treatment options and just hearing a, um, 
professionals say try this for three months if it's not working next you know to hear that from someone rather than i think so many so many of us are having to self-advocate through you know a minefield of healthcare professionals who some are trying their best but they they don't know the treatment plan they don't understand it um so i think that is definitely another webinar we can plan if people want to hear andrea perhaps talk about through the um through the treatment plan and yes and someone has just asked is this process the same um not globally but from country to country and i think while systems will will vary and healthcare systems will vary i think any good practitioner from what i understand would want to to make sure that they are making the right decision um and if you go to that considering surgery page on the IAPMD website um you will see the reasons for that because they do have a duty of care to do no harm and so um they have to go through these steps to ensure that you have the correct diagnosis because you know there are people that go through i've yeah. got two personal friends that have been through the the surgery and discovered they actually have bipolar so they may have had you know been able to have different treatment um and they actually had pme of bipolar so it is really important that you do the accurate tracking you track your cycle you track your thing and you push and push and push until you find a doctor who will help you and we will i will talk a bit more about that in a moment um but yes i think in any country any good provider would make you go through these steps yeah so just, so just quickly you know i can't can't reinforce how important having an accurate diagnosis is i mean that's absolutely essential so an apps an accurate diagnosis of pmdd and again, that doesn't mean that you don't have a premenstrual exacerbation of an underlying mood disorder, but it's important to rule that out and to be actually have the, the, the PMDD diagnosis. These symptoms are luteal phase specific. They come on like a light switch, they go off like a light switch, and that only happens in your luteal phase. And that's the the, the document, the 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 diarying that's really the diary. <laughs> How do you say that? The diary. The symptoms, what symptoms happen is so important. Do have tracking tools on our website and um, there is an app called me vpmdd um, which is free you can download and it links to lots of iapmd resources um, and it's great you can print it off to take to your doctor and there is no blood or saliva test for pmdds so, and anyone who is the famous thing if you are having trouble finding a doctor um, if you go to um, the ipm.org provider.directory and um, you can do a search there we've just updated it in february and um, so you can now add when you're um, when you are looking for a doctor if you're looking for a specific type or a specific type of treatment so if you're at the chemical, chemical menopause stage or if you're an earlier or later stage you can you can filter for that um, and i just want to stress so this is a peer recommended provider and um, directory so it is filled out by people who have seen doctors and would recommend them and um so if you have seen someone that you think is great please get them added it's really simple from that from that page on the website um add in details add a review so other people know what to expect it very very much is crowdsourced information and we need numbers we need people to leave reviews so um go on there now and see if your doctor's on there um if they're not on there and they're good please add them and if you um if they are on there please leave them a review just so other people know what to expect and the other thing I wouldn't hesitate doing, now part of the problem is that, you know, the diagnosis and management of PMDD finds itself in a little bit of a lost land currently between whether, whether it should be uh, managed by or whether it's a psychiatric issue and you should be seeing a psychiatrist or whether it's a gynecologic issue and you should be seeing a gynecologist. And historically, training for in either field has not done a good job at educating physicians about PMDD. We're hoping that's going to change with time. Um, in the meantime, 
it may be hard for you to find a, your gyne a gynecologist who feels um, comfortable in management other than just trying a birth control pill. I would absolutely, absolutely encourage you, if you have a doctor that's worth anything, that doctor is going to be very willing to learn to be able to help you. And so there are resources on IATMD for physicians. Um, there's guidelines of uh, evidence-based management and uh, diagnosis and all that. So I wouldn't hesitate to either provide your, your, uh, your care provider with uh, the resources. It's very, very important that you don't skip, and it's absolutely really essential that you go through um, what we call chemical menopause um, or chemically mimicking what's going to happen to you after your surgery. So if we go back a minute to my earlier biology yeah, lesson that I gave, um, the, the, the hypothalamus, so a high center in the brain that, that produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GnRH, that then tells the pituitary gland to release FSH and LH, which then tells the ovaries to produce the hormones. Um, this system is from, from once we reach our, our first periods until we reach menopause, this system is active and cyclical, and it relies on a positive feedback mechanism, um, meaning that uh, the GnRH, the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland talks to the ovary, and when the hormones are produced, this cycle just kind of keeps itself going. Now, the way the hypothalamus releases the GnRH is in a cyclical, is in a pulsatile fashion. It doesn't release it constantly. It releases it in a pulsatile way. Um, and that, that, that pulsatile release then triggers the pituitary gland and then, which then triggers the ovary. When, uh, when, when you're put into chemical menopause, when a GnRH agonist is used, what happens then is that it ultimately overrides your hypothalamus. And then instead of this pulsatile release, it's a constant release of the GnRH. And when that happens, it shuts down the pituitary gland and then it ultimately shuts down the, the ovary. And so there's no longer production of, um, of estrogen. And so that's exactly, it's not the exact same mechanism once you go into menopause. It sort of is, menopause is where the, the ovary starts it, but at the end of the day, it's the same effect, low estrogen levels because you are um, suppressing from the brain, level of the brain. Now, part of the part of the the the, the thing. Well, I guess that probably is enough for that. Great. Instead of getting too complicated. With it. Um, so, and then the idea is that it's reversible. Once you stop receiving the GnRH, you come out of the chemical menopause. But because it mimics what's going to happen in the absence of your ovaries producing estrogen. It's a it's it's an essential it's essential really prior to taking out your ovaries because once they're out they can't go back and this way we at least know that you're going to respond to this um, management option. Mm -hmm. Everything in in, in the in normally everything is pulsatile in a wave. The the GnRH is is released pulsatile. There's a, a pulsatile nature to your cyclical hormones that we talked about, and then it just starts itself all over again every month. Okie doke. So it's these points, it's the brain's response to these fluctuations that, that call the, cause the PMDD symptoms. When, so when the, when the brain is producing its own gonadotropin releasing hormone, it's pulsatile, that triggers the changes in the pituitary gland to the ovary to have the, the, the cyclical changes that allow the first part of the menstrual cycle ovulation the second or luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, which is the problem, and then the period. And then it all starts again because all these hormones are interdependent on each other. When we shut down the hypothalamus by overriding the cyclic release of the GnRH, we ultimately down the chain, shut down the ovary production of the hormones. So then there's your body is no longer producing 
estrogen and progesterone, you're no longer ovulating, you no longer have a luteal phase, and you should, with the diagnosis of PMDD is correct, no longer have your PMDD symptoms. However, <laughs> the low estrogen can cause menopausal. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the low that absolutely. So that's where the the low estrogen levels, um, you know, along the same mechanism of action of um, well, I'm oh, sorry for a minute. You know, PMDD. No, that's okay. P no, no, you're good. PMDD is one of the reproductive mood disorders. The other ones are uh, postpartum depression and. Uh, menopausal transition depression or menopausal perimenopausal depression. Um, the we believe to a certain extent, especially for some women, that it's the profound drop in estrogen, both in menopause and postpartum, that uh, is an interaction with your serotonin system in your brain, which maintains your mood and sense of well-being. That when estrogen levels plummet, depressive symptoms. Uh, appear um, that potentially even one of the mechanisms for uh, p women with P people with PMDD because when in that second part of your cycle the luteal phase not remember if I said not only is the progesterone spiking but your estrogen level is relatively falling and just that small level in some people is enough to trigger a drop in serotonin which is enough to trigger depressive symptoms so it gets a little bit. It gets can get a little bit dicey, but again, that's why with the GnRH, does your PMDD symptoms get better? But then, when we add back the estrogen, how are you feeling? Okay. With so, that? Um, some people have been asking, how long does it take for the the chemical menopause to to work to fully kick in? Um, you there cycle with a GnRH agonist cycle suppression kicks in within about two weeks. But we, you do have a bit of a flare in the first two weeks as it's down, it upregulates the system before it downregulates the system. Um, and so that can be a bit of a tumultuous time in those first two weeks to a month. But certainly by the second month or perhaps the second in injection, we would definitely want to see a resolution of your symptoms. It's so difficult, isn't it? Because everyone's so different. I very much didn't have that experience. They never really fully worked for me i ovulated through gnrh treatment um yeah and that, and yeah that's a great ovaries yeah. i i, I don't know yes. in an ideal situation <laughs> i just know. wanted to make that in case other people because, were thinking, well, you know that didn't work for me yeah, um yeah. Yeah. Because, and, I, and i think that's important because i mean that's a really important thing to remember and what makes this also very very challenging as well is that we're dealing with hormones and we're dealing with brain chemistry and every single person is is different and has their own subtle variations of how they're going to respond to very this. much so hrt is that usually started from the beginning of usually um chemical menopause is that recommended or do they normally i i know it, i see various people going through different systems so some people don't start it until six months some people are on it already and um, some people start it three months in is there um an ideal for that or does it depend on the provider? I don't know that we know that. Okay. I don't think we know that. I think it depends provider to provider. I think, um, uh, you know, the idea of, of holding off, I think, I think for the, for the management of uh, PMDD, once, once relief is seen, there's no reason in delaying okay. add back therapy. I think that there's an argument to be made that you hold add back therapy to see if pure suppression relieves symptoms. Okay, so once it's once the relief is gained, then that's usually when people would look into. And again, when starting, I would say, I would say that would be that's my per, that's my personal practice, and I think I have course, to I have yes. to clarify that because I. It, not at this point it's not evidence-based and if a provider was doing something differently and that's what they felt in their clinical practice works I'm yes, certainly not going to you know say that very wrong. much so and um, so um someone has asked how can they tell if they're still ovulating through that would that could that be done just through ovulation sticks through the GnRH um sure 
that would be yeah, someone suggesting ultrasound but i don't think i've never heard that suggested just the ovulation stips that you um you pee on <laughs> when you're on your ovulating dates and I think, and I think, yeah and i think that the, the main the main piece is that we, you only have to go in and, and investigate if you're still in the US, someone has asked, um, "What is there anything that begin to, can be done if insurance doesn't cover the GnRH treatment?" Oh, oh. Touchy subject. It's like the bane of my, the bane of my, the bane of my existence. Uh, all, all that can, all that you can do is, um, you know, try and have your clinician advocate for you and um, try to appeal um, the, try to appeal the the the, 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 the denial. It's very, 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 yeah. very, very frustrating. Um, I'm hoping, honestly, I'm hoping that once, you know, if and when ACOG comes out with some management guidelines and they talk about using GRNO um, agonist and or, I won't go into it, but antagonist, which is another medication that's available mm -hmm. at least stateside now, Laura, I forgot to ask you if you have that in the, in the UK yet. Um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful. <laughs> That in the not too distant future, this will be it'll be recognized as an indication for that medication, and we won't reach such we won't we won't have so much pushback from insurance. That would be a definite definite move in the right direction. Do you need to be on HRT when you try a chemical menopause? Um, if uh, you, you don't need to be on it. Um, if you're only on it for a brief period of time, but it would not be a bad idea to once you get system, once you once you find that you have relief from your PMDD symptoms in a cycle or two, that third cycle it would behoove you to try um, estrogen uh, add back therapy because that's what your 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 provider is going to want you to be on and what you really should be on. Mm -hmm long term after the surgery at least until the age of natural menopause around these and someone's asked is it normal to bleed every 10-ish days whilst having gnrh and add back um okay. yes yes because what's happening is that um the lining of your uterus is just responding to the the estrogen but it it's, it's, it's just res responding because it's getting stimulated by estrogen, but it doesn't have its normal direction to do this in a very cyclical fashion. So the lining of the uterus is just kind of randomly shedding um, because it's not being directed to do it uniformly. Um, but estrogen will always, you know, thicken that lining a little bit. And some people may not bleed when they're on estrogen. Some people may. Um, you know, if you're if you if you're a bit overweight and you have extra um, adipose tissue, adipose tissue makes estrogens as well. So the add back could just be enough to make you have a withdrawal, to make you have some sort of a withdrawal bleed. It's not truly your menstrual bleeding. It's not truly a menstrual cycle or your menses. It's really breakthrough bleeding, and and, and that's to be that's to be expected. Well, yeah. So yeah, so if we're going to stick with the GRNH agonist, uh, the GRNH agonist, which is what we were just speaking about, that comes in, um, in injection, in, at least in the States, and that's mm -hmm. all I can really speak to, Laura. It comes in an injection form, which is marketed mm -hmm. as Depo-Lupon. Um, it comes in a, a nasal spray, which we don't really use often. In I think it's more of a, a UK-based um, starting point often. It's, um, I think it's known as like the quick starter yeah. Cinerel spray. Yeah, so we have it here, um, but it's not it's not typically the go to for uh, gynecologists, and we're we typically will use uh, GRNRH in other gynecologic conditions for the management of um, uh, endometriosis and or uh, uterine fibroids. Um, and then the oral form in this country is a GRNH agonist antagonist, which. Um, uh, shuts down uh, the GNRH production by opposing it rather than acting like it. But, but that's a newer medication on the market now. So, so um, you know, la 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 the laparoscopic, if you're going to have uh, just your ovaries or your ov ovaries and fallopian tubes performed, that's going to be done um, the majority of the time. 
through a laparoscopic approach or a minimally invasive approach. And that's the preferred way of uh, a surgery um, uh, these days. And typically gynecologic laparoscopic surgery, um, there are three incisions, um, uh, a, 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 an incision in the belly button, either into it or just below it, called an umbilical incision, and then two other additional incisions. Typically they will be in your, the lower part of your abdomen on the left or the right side. Uh, some uh, surgeons will keep them on the same side. Some surgeons will put them up a little bit higher near the umbilical incision, but at the end of the day, there generally are three um, incisions made at the time of laparoscopic And they surgery. leave quite small scars, um, don't they? So it's... Yeah. And they usually do heal, they usually do heal, heal quite well. And then the surgeon will go in with cameras and instruments and do all the, sur all the internal surgery um, uh, with the, the, what, the laparoscopic instruments. You do, with this procedure, you do have to have general anesthesia. You do need to be asleep. Um, that's because uh, this procedure requires that the abdominal cavity is filled with uh, CO2 or gas to make it a safe procedure and move the, give space for the surgeon and also move the bowels uh, See, this, out of this, the this, way. Someone just asked, um, this, this is the one that's also known as keyhole, isn't it? So keyhole surgery, is that right? Yeah. Yes, it's also very yeah. And uh, often, this is often a, an approach as well, the preferred approach for uh, a hysterectomy. Um, ideally, the best approach for a hysterectomy is vaginal. It's the most minimally invasive. There's no incisions on your abdomen. Everything is done um, uh, uh, through the vagina. Um, uh, also allowing for the, the removal of the, the fallopian tubes and ovaries. But Oftentimes it can be a little bit challenging and especially in this particular indication for the surgery, we definitely want the ovaries and all the ovaries to come. So a lot of surgeons may prefer to do um, a, a laparoscopic approach, perhaps um, what we either a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. So the whole surgery is done um, through those small incisions or a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy. Um, at the at the end of the day, it's the same. the the end The end result is the same. There's a every all of the pelvic organs are removed, including the cervix, and the top of the vagina is stitched. Um, the difference between the two approaches is that one is done all the way through the camera, even the last bit of incision and stitching the top of the vagina is done through the the, the small incisions abdominally. Uh, with a vaginal assisted laparoscopic procedure, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries and the upper part of the blood vessels to the uterus are removed laparoscopically and then the surgeon then goes vaginally and uh, opens up the vagina and removes the, the lower part of the cervix and the, the, upper, the cervix and the lower part of the vagina through the, and then the whole specimen comes out through your vagina and the cervix is, the vagina is stitched through the vagina. So at the end of the day, the result is the same, but it's just the approach. And these two types of minimally minimally invasive um, hysterectomies uh, or, or uh, by, you know, hysterectomy, bilateral salpingolophorectomy is much preferred over an abdominal surgery in terms of facilitating a much quicker recovery for you. But there are times and indications in which an abdominal surgery may may be the the route um, that is necessary for you, um, and there are certain clinical situations and scenarios um, where that may be suggested. But I would say the majority of people are going to undergo some sort of minimally invasive approach, either a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, bilateral salpingolophorectomy, or that same procedure. Uh, as a laparoscopic assistant. And so the, the top of the vagina is kind of clipped into a cuff, isn't it? Someone said to me it's a bit like the, the top of a tube of toothpaste. It's sort of like it ends up being it ends up being like a blind it ends up being sort of what we call we'll call sort of a blind a blind pouch because in normal anatomy, when I can the the, the cervix sits at the top and, and, and comes through the top of the of the of the of the vaginal opening. The vagina sort of is up around the cervix which is coming down into the top of it and then when the cervix is removed it leaves you know a cuff or a hole and that's that's what's stitched together so there's a, a an opening in the top of the vagina 
and then it that's that's and it's usually in this direction, but that's stitched that's stitched down and stitched together, and um, that scars down and um, you know creates a you know a, a very strong uh, you don't have to worry about it opening or tearing as long as you wait to put anything in your vagina for several weeks after the surgery um, it heals it feels fine and there's um, it has very good integrity to it structural integrity so um one that gets asked a lot is um and confuses people you know is how will i feel waking up from surgery so we've just got a list of like the common experiences here um i very much was disoriented i, I definitely had the top two when i woke up i was really confused and was quite nauseous and and, and threw up for sure and I think one that we have that we've missed on here too is that a lot of people will be very, oh, really? very okay. cold and have a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of shivering and rigors, like like the kind of uncontrollable, uncontrollable shivering. That's that's not an uncommon um, complaint as well. The nurses in the post-operative care units are usually very good about keeping you covered and warm, but you may you may be shiver you may notice that you're shivering when you wake okay. up. Okay. Oh, I should make sure we we add that in then. And could you just explain a bit about the um the trapped gas pain yeah so again if we're doing our due diligence as surgeons we try to do the best that we can to get rid of that co2 that we had to use to distend your abdomen to, in order to do a laparoscopic procedure safely sometimes we're not able to completely clear that all out of your abdominal cavity and so what will end up happening is that that co2 will be in there and it has a nasty tendency to irritate the diaphragm um, and the diaphragm uh, causes pain, it causes referred pain, that stitch in your shoulder that you probably all have had at some point in time when you've been out and exercising and you just get that horrible, awful stabbing pain in your, in your shoulder. And so that is one, um, the, one the, the hallmark of uh, you know, the, the irritation from the, from the gas uh, that's been trapped inside the abdomen. You're, you're, you don't have to worry about that. It's going to go away. Your body's going to resorb it and have it go away. But while it's waiting to resorb it, um, you can get that pain. Right. And again, a lot of this is, is covered on the website. We've got um, a bit more in detail afterwards. So um, if you have your ovaries removed, you are in surgical menopause. And um, so could you tell us a bit more about if people have to take HRT um, I know a lot of people have had bad experience to, to hormone based treatments so sometimes they're quite scared to touch it or they have um, a bad few days and, and they decide to give up on it but could you just explain a bit more about um, if people need HRT and if so why it's important yeah, so I mean I think we, we have to break that down into the two different, mm -hmm. two different categories so you're going to do estrogen, estrogen replacement therapy or uh, estrogen. Um, you know, ideally, that's what we're. That's the one that we're hoping that you're. You'll have to be on. HRT would be estrogen and progesterone um, together. Uh, I think I just like to say that if you're if you have if you're in premature surgical menopause, which is what you will for sure be in. Um, if you have your, uh, when you have your ovaries removed with the surgery, um, your body will immediately start to feel the effects of um, an absence of estrogen. And that is both uh, symptomatic, but also can have long term uh, health concerns. Um, you know, uh, we, you'll have the estrogen is very important in your body. Um, to maintain your bone health, uh, to um, for cardiovascular protection in your lifetime, uh, women women estrogen is very important for protecting your heart. Um, there is uh, you know thoughts that it helps with we know that it helps with your with your with your um, brain functioning. Um, so in order to help not have those things deteriorate very quickly estrogen is is really important it also is very important for your 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 vaginal your vaginal health your genitourinary health so your bladder health your vaginal health 
Yeah, and then if you have, if you still have a uterus, you'll have to add back um, a progesterone in some form to uh, protect the lining of your of your endometrium. But the hope would have been that you would have tried that uh, uh, preoperatively to make sure that you were going to be able to tolerate the add back uh, progestins. But it's really advocated and recommended for uh, your overall long term health that when you are in premature surgical menopause that you, um, unless it's seriously contraindicated, um, that you are on some form of estrogen therapy. And um, what is your take on um, the duration of estrogen therapy? Um, what age should you be on it till? Well, I, yeah, so, yeah, so I, 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 I counsel my patients um, that you really should be on it until the age of um, natural menopause. I mean, the thing that you have to remember, obviously there's a, a lot of concern uh, about uh, being on hormone replacement therapy and uh, the breast cancer risk. Um, but I think that you need to understand that breast tissue, in general, breast tissue is are programmed to be exposed to hormones, estrogen, and if you need to, both progester progesterone or progestins until progesterone, in particular, are uh, your, your breast tissue is programmed to 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 be exposed to that at least until the age of natural menopause. The amount of hormones that we're giving to you, that are going to be given to you in a, a pharmacologic dose as your add back post surgical. Um, is not even going to come close to what your normal physiological levels of um, your own body's hormones would have been. So you really do not have to be worried about worried about exposure to hormone replacement therapy and a breast cancer risk until you've at least reached the age of natural menopause, about age 52, which is the average age. And then you can regroup and readdress with your provider as to what the risks and benefits are uh, about staying on it. And, and for some women, that may happen a little bit sooner. And for some women, that discussion may happen a little bit later. If you are on Facebook, um, I will share the link in a minute. We do have a Facebook group, which is specifically for people like us who are at the stage of either um, considering surgery, learning more about it, preparing for it, going through it, recovering. Um, and there's loads of people with mixed experiences in there. Um, and someone just asked me to um, add a little bit more about my chemical menopause experience, if you don't mind, just really quickly. Um, but yeah, so I, I started on, um, so in the UK, um, it's not generally used, but it's in the UK system, hormone therapy, where um, HRT is basically used um, before chemical menopause to try and flatten down that cycle um that didn't work for me so i moved on to then chemical menopause i did two months of the cinerel um which wasn't a pleasant experience and and then i moved on to decapeptil for the next seven months and i didn't respond well at all um up to my hrt still wasn't responding was still cycling very clear cyclical pattern um but worse <laughs> um but thankfully, I think it was pretty textbook and um, I was referred for surgery because I was very clearly still ovulating. So that's known as, um, well, I don't know if it's, it's known as, I was told it's, you know, it's not a fair trial of a chemical menopause if you're still ovulating through it. So I think I have my grand super ovaries um, <laughs> that just battle through everything and did not want to shut down. So, um, but I'm happy to talk about that. Anyone wants to talk about it um, and also, IAPMD do have um, free peer support. So if there's anyone that wants to talk through any um, decision making, wants any further information, resources, um, you can just go to the IAPMD.org forward slash peer dash support and it's free. Um, we are there as much as we possibly can be and it's run by trained volunteers um, who either live with PMDD or um, are on the other side of PMDD. So don't forget that's there as a resource. Um, they really are fantastic.